Yeah. Well, we're going to start in winter, of course, because winter here is, seems like it's a half a year all the time. It, so there's not a lot to do in the winter. Everything is covered with snow. There's my house and my old cow. And so the bees are all tucked away for the winter. And the snow piles up deep and deep and deep. And so what we do in the wintertime is work in the wood shop and build equipment, repair equipment, think, plan. A lot of the thinking goes on during the wintertime because there's not much else to do. So let's start in early spring. We're going to check the si cluster size and the food levels of the colonies. So this is what I'm hoping to see. I'm hoping to see nice, large clusters, um, maybe with some honey. The one on the left, I can see honey around the cluster, so that one's fine. But what about the one on the right? That makes me nervous. And so I dig around with my hive tool and I look for some honey. And if this colony doesn't have any honey to eat, if I can't find honey, I need to feed them. We look for cluster size. This is a, a smallish cluster. I can see it goes down inside the combs. But it's a small cluster and they have honey. This is a larger cluster, but things don't really look right. In fact, that cluster is dead because it's starved to death. So you see what happens is they started raising brood and they used up all their honey before I could get around to feed them and they starved. Well, in the winter time, we can't really feed syrup. Feeding, feeding syrup in the winter before the bees can fly is a, just a, um, uh, asking for issues with dysentery and so, in the, in the winter when, they're, when they can't fly, we feed them fondant if they're low on food, which is you know, a soft sugar. We also feed them pollen substitute. Pollen substitute is a, is a high protein um, uh, patty used um, to supply them their protein that they need. And they really love it. I, they, just, they just suck it right down. Well, the reason we do this is the bees the bees start raising brood in the spring, and they need protein. And the protein they use was stored last autumn from goldenrod and asters and other, other fall blooming plants. And they preserve that pollen under honey. And then in the spring, there's protein available for them to raise babies. But what happens if they run out of protein? Then they stop raising brood. And raised, uh, a brood cessation in the spring is really a dangerous thing. The bees are getting old. They're starting to lose their, their field force as they work out in the field. And the colony population begins to dwindle. And they need to be replacing that population with new bees. But if they can't raise new bees because they ha have a lack of protein, the colony dwindles, it's called spring dwindling, and many colonies can die because of that. So we give them a protein to get over that hurdle until the first protein, uh, until the first pollens are available. Now, some people don't like to use artificial protein, artificial pollen substitute, as it's called. So you can actually trap pollen and fill combs and put that full pollen comb next to the brood, and they'll use that instead of artificial pollen substitute. So finally, in, in, um, in March, you know, we go from about November sometime until March or even April before there's a cleansing flight. And the bees can't defecate until they have a cleansing flight. And so they're going all winter long and finally we have a day that's warm enough for them to have a general flight and out they come and out comes their defecate and it's all over the place. Good day to wear a hat to the bee yard. Another thing they need at this time of year, remember everything is frozen here. This is winter here in Vermont and all the, all the liquid is frozen and they can't gather liquid. 
So they'll even, when it's a warm day on first cleansing flight day, they'll even land on the snow to try to suck up some of the melting snow. <clears throat> and so that first cleansing flight day, you can see what the snow looks like. It's covered with, with feces. But this is a good thing. And the first reel of water that's available to them is, a, is on the outer cover, on the lid. When the snow and the ice melt, and it's warm enough for the bees to fly, this is where they get their first drinks of water. And then, then the sugar makers, the sap starts to run in the maple trees, and the sugar makers are boiling it down, and now spring really starts to break. And now we can feed sugar syrup. So colonies that are light on feed, once they, they can fly regularly, once the bees can fly regularly, we can start feeding them sugar syrup. And it's the same thing as with pollen substitute and protein. If the bees run out of uh, feed or they start getting low on feed, they'll shut down brood rearing right at the wrong time of year when brood rearing needs to be increasing, not decreasing. Finally, we start to get our first blooms. This is poplar. We call it poplar. It's not poplar. It's trem Populus tremuloides, which is quaking aspen. And it moves into alders. I believe you all have alders in the, in the UK, in the British Isles. This is one of our very earliest pollens. And then it moves into the maple. The maple bloom. This is the first uh, significant uh, nectar flow. I've seen very many colonies on the brink of starvation get saved by the nectar flow from maple trees. So this is happening, oh gosh, April, middle of April to the end of April. <clears throat> and then the willows. Willows are, are probably uh, the first really good pollen flow. And um, this is, and so in, in order to show you what I mean by a pollen flow, I took this colony and I plugged up the entrance with grass. So the bees will accumulate on the side of the hive. And oh my gosh, look at how much pollen is coming into this colony. So this is what I'm talking about. When we reach this point, we're pretty much over the winter. So once we've gone around and checked all the honey production colonies, we have to check the overwintered nucleus colonies. We run some glaze 500 or more nucleus colonies through the winter. And they're all wrapped up for winter, but we do the same thing. We open them up, we check them for feed, we check them for pollen substitute, make sure they have, uh, they have protein. And this is what we're looking for. These are the kind of colonies that I, I'm looking for. This is um, probably an eight comb nucleus colony on each side, so there's two nucleus colonies here. Snow has just melted. The colonies are still wrapped for winter. And look at the population in those. And all of those, those colonies were made the previous summer with, with very limited resources and allowed to build up into these colonies and overwintered, and this is what we have in the spring. These are our heifers, there's another one. These are our heifers. You know, a dairy farmer, heifers are the replacements for the old cows. These are my heifers, these are my replacements for my old colonies. And then we have this, this other bloom, it's called uh, colt's foot, and I never believed colt's foot uh, was worked with by the bees, but it is, and look at that, sometimes there's multiple bees on each flower. It's a wonderful plant. Now we can take our winter wraps off. So this is a production colony, a uh, apiary, wrapped for winter. And this is a nucleus colony apiary, wrapped for winter, beginning to be unwrapped. So we take the wrappers off. As we're doing this, I'm looking for signs at the, uh, at the entrance to the colony. Is the colony alive? Is it vibrant? Without opening this colony, I look at the cleanings that are coming out of the colony, and I know this is a good house cleaning colony that has the strength to clean up all the refuse that's gathered during the winter time. This is an excellent thing. And we're looking for cluster size. 
This is a beautiful uh, colony of bees that's come through the winter, packed with bees still in the spring. So once we've gone around and, um, and made sure everybody's got enough uh, feed, um, we've got them unwrapped, now it's time to start supering. We need to get the supers on early. The, 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 our first major nectar flow is from dandelion. And this can be any time in the early to mid-May. And once, once this, uh, this flow starts, if we don't have supers on, the nectar goes in the brood nests. And it plugs up the brood nest. And so that, that causes swarming. We need to get some nectar storage room above the active brood rearing cluster. And so this is how we do it. We get our supers on, um, gosh, in April sometime, you know, way before the flow. So now we've got supers on the production colonies so that if the flow comes and we're busy doing something else, the, the colonies aren't going to swarm. Now we're transferring our, all those 400 nucleus colonies into shipping containers because we sell a lot of them. And so here we are making up cardboard nuke boxes, checking for the queens. The queen has to go in the shipping box. If the queen is, if you don't actually actively spy that queen, there's a chance that the queen didn't go in the nuke and then we get in trouble when we sell it with a queenless nuke, so. And we're fix setting up 10 frame colonies in Langstroth's, making new colonies. And then we get our first major flow. So this is about uh, the first half of May. And it's from dandelion. And everybody gets some dandelions. You all get dandelions. Everybody gets dandelions. Not dandelions like we get dandelions. I mean, when this nectar flow starts, it's, it's like you died and gone to heaven. Look at that. And it's just everywhere. And, it's, and the apples come on. And so you have this dandelion fruit bloom, as I call it. And this is the first major, major flow of the year. We, we, can, fill, we can fill supers of honey on this flow. And because it's such, an, uh, such a major flow, it can promote swarming. Now, what do you do about swarming? Swarming is all about population management. How to manage the population to, to maintain strong, productive colonies, but in the meantime, they won't swarm. Like this, beautiful cluster. Or this, or this, <laughs> or that, okay. So what can we do? Well, we could split the colonies. We can make an artificial swarm or we can take a nuke out of the bees and brood away from the colony and give it more room and knock down the population and, and try to prevent these colonies from swarming. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the ways that we, uh, we employ to um, prevent swarming is it entails reversing the brood, brood chamber and equalizing brood among the colonies. Now, you, you all, a lot of you have single broods or brood in a super. Well, I can't run my bees on single broods and brood in a super. I need, I need two broods in a super because we have such an intense buildup in the spring that single broods and a brood in a super, that everything would be swarming. So we reverse the order of the, the boxes. So the top box is on the bottom and the bottom box is on top. Now, when do we do this? Well, we try to do this, we try to do this before the dandelion bloom. So let's see what we've done so far. A couple weeks before this, we added supers. And so the early nectar flows are going in the supers. Now below those two supers is my brood nest with two, two broods and a super. 
Now, if we hadn't put those supers on there, the nectar comes in and it goes in the brood nest, right? It's like in a tree. When a colony is in a cavity in a tree, there's nobody to put supers on. There's nobody to manage the colony. The colony has gone up through the brood nest and is now at the top of the, of the, of the brood nest where the remainder of the honey is. And then the nectar comes in. And where are they going to put the nectar? Well, they're going to put it in the top brood box. But what else is in the top brood box? There's brood in the top brood box, but there's nowhere for them to store the nectar. So as the brood emerges, they store the nectar in the, emerging, in the cells of the emerging brood. <clears throat> this sets up a competition between nectar storers and brood rearers. And it forces the queen down into the colony because the top is being packed with incoming nectar. And that downward pressure caused by that incoming nectar, when there's no supers on the colony, is the main key, in my opinion, for swarming. So that's what we're trying to do, number one, with early supering. That gives the bees a place for overhead nectar storage, so it doesn't go in the brood nest. But as the incoming nectar increases, we have to do something again to give overhead nectar storage and overhead room for the queen to lay. So we take the supers off, we lay the colony on the ground, we check the colony, we crack it apart, and we look at the bottom of the we look at the bottom of the top box. That's where the, the brood nest is. And we're looking for swarm cells. And there they are. So you see what's happened is that even though there were supers on this colony, the incoming the strength of that incoming flow has kicked off swarm preparations. So now what do we do? We cut out all the, all the cups, all the queen cups with eggs and larvae and queen cells, and we reverse the colony. Well, the boxes on the bottom are pretty much empty. And so when we reverse the colony, we're taking brood comb and putting it above the active brood rearing cluster, allowing the queen to move up. And it's that upward movement of the queen and her cluster that takes that pressure off, that swarming pressure. So we can raise gigantic colonies of bees and they don't swarm. And so now you see this colony has now been reversed. The brood nest order is reversed. The first two supers on are getting full and we add another super. And as long as after, afterward, during, uh, during the honey production time, as long as we keep ahead of them in supers. You know, it takes two supers of nectar to make one super of honey. And so they need extra storage room for all that nectar because nectar is 85% water and honey is 85% sugars and they have to get rid of that water and that water is volume. So now, we've done our second round of supering. So we supered once, we reversed, and we're supering again as we're reversing, and we're putting one or two more supers on, so now they have four supers on already, and it's only the middle of May. But this is what we need, because our flow is so intense. So what have you accomplished in this reversing? Home space above the cluster, so the queen can move up and that downward pressure is taken away. And nectar storage above the cluster, so that nectar isn't going in emerging brood, it's going out to the side and above, which is where it should be. Now, because we've got the colonies apart at this time of year, this is a great time to evaluate the queen. You sit down and you look at the brood, you're looking for queen cells anyway, and so you, now you can evaluate the, 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 the quality of your queen. This is the kind of a brood pattern I'm looking for. I'm looking for this, uh, th this beautiful white pearly larvae. Every larva, every cell is full, 
Every larva next to another larva is almost the same age. The queen is laying and it, she's just filling the, the comb space like this. That is a nice queen. And an, and an unsealed pattern like that becomes a sealed pattern like this. And this is what we're looking for. This, on the other hand, is not so good. Empty cells, larvae of different ages, all, all mixed up together, no cohesive pattern. These need to be requeened. This is another example of a colony that needs to be requeened. You have old brood, young brood, empty cells, eggs, all scattered, all scattered together. The queen is not laying in a nice circular pattern. She's all over the place. This colony needs to be requeened. This colony has a terrible pattern. Another one, shotgun pattern is called. This colony needs to be requeened. And again, the queen isn't able to keep up. The pollen gatherers are coming in with this huge pollen flow. They plug the whole brood nest with, with pollen. The queen has nowhere to lay. This queen should have been replaced already. This one obviously should be replaced. This is a laying worker. This is a failed queen. There is no queen in this hive. The worker bees take over, start laying eggs. Of course, they're unfertilized, and only drones result in this colony needs to be requeened. Now sometimes you'll find colonies that have multiple eggs in the cells, but that's because it's a new queen or a queen that doesn't have enough support staff, so she has to keep laying, but she can't expand her cluster. So this is how I tell, positively, that what I'm seeing is a drone layer. I mean, excuse me, is a laying worker. Queen cups with multiple eggs like this is pretty much definitive of the laying worker colony. And because we are now got the colonies apart and we're, we're inspecting, we're, we're, we're evaluating the queens, this is a great time to do your first disease check of the summer. You want to see nice pearly white brood like this. You want to see sealed brood patterns like this. This is not what you want to see. This is um, sunken cappings, uh, dead, dead brood. Um, this is American fowl brood disease, one of the most deadly diseases, if not the most deadly disease we have. It's a spore-forming bacteria, and once the spores are in the hive, they're viable for 70 years or, or, or maybe forever, certainly a, a lifetime. And the only way to get rid of it is to burn it. So when you find American fowl brood, you burn it. This is another brood disease called European fowl brood. Um, this is increasing in our, in our region. I know you're having problems with it in, uh, in the UK. Um, this is also caused by a bacteria, but it's not a spore-forming bacteria. Uh, this is another disease. This is a virus called sac brood. The, um, the pupa gets a little sack around it. It's a virus. There's really nothing you can do except requeen the colony. Uh, this is a fungal di disease called chalk brood. Um, re in, um, requeening this colony with a, with a hygienic strain of bees will, will eliminate the chalk brood, and you'll never see it again. So now we've gone through, we've, uh, we've, we've supered, we've reversed, and in its, we're in the dandelion fruit bloom, and it's time to start setting up our cell builders. And this is when we do it, dandelion fruit bloom. So the brood that I, I harvest to boost my cell building colonies into a massively strong colony so I can get the best queen cells I can get I harvest brood from what I call brood factories, which are nucleus colonies whose entire reason for existence is to make me brood for setting up cell builders and for making nucleus colonies. So here's a, here's a group of four nucleus colonies that are getting very strong. It's right about the dandelion bloom, and I, I begin harvesting brood from them. Even though I harvest brood from them, they're still getting stronger and stronger. So this is a brood factory yard. 
And I go around from nuke to nuke, and I take a frame or two of brood away from each one. And I take enough so that they won't swarm before I get back there again, maybe in a couple of weeks, but not so much that they dwindle. And because I boost these colonies, that colony on the photo on the left is a real strong cell builder um, colony, and the queen right part is below the queen excluder, and the cell building part, before I graft into it, is above. And on grafting day, I separate it, and I, sh I shake the bees, the nurse bees, into my, into my cell building unit, which is now queenless, but packed, packed with bees. And so I put my graft into that. Do my graft for my breeder colonies. You know, I have a number of breeding colonies of, of queens that I like to graft from that I'm trying to uh, propagate their genetics. And, um, And these queens all come from my own apiaries. I don't buy in queens. I don't buy in stock. I evaluate my bees, and I pick the best stock, local stock, stock that, uh, that grows in my apiary under my management and that I've kept records for years. <clears throat> so once we've got the, um, the grafting done, first round of grafting done. Um, the day before the queen cells are ready to harvest, we have to set up the mating nukes. So these are the mating nukes. The way they've been, uh, they've been overwintered. There's actually two boxes on each mating nuke and they're, uh, my mating nukes are four ways and that get reduced to two ways and then put on top of another one. And so that I'm actually wintering each queen, there's two queens in each of those stands each queen has 16 combs. And we overwinter them that way, and then the day before the queen cells are ready, we break them back down into four ways, queenless four ways, and take them to the, um, to the mating yard. And so here we are setting up cell builders, I mean, excuse me, setting up mating nukes from one of the uh, groups of overwintered nukes. And now we're into more of the summer flowers, the summer flow. This one is honeysuckle. Great, great flow of very mild um, white honey. Or our, these are our brambles. <clears throat> I think your brambles are much later in the season. This is early June and the brambles. And this is blackberry, gray pollen. I think you have gray pollen too over there, don't you? And because we make such huge, well-stocked cell builders, this is the kind of uh, results we get on the queen cells. Enormous queen cells, still packed with jelly on the day we harvest the cells. Every one of those pupa got more jelly than it could possibly eat. And that's where I think quality comes in. So the first queens, our first queens are, are available every year um, Mm, let's see, June 13th, I believe, is pretty much every year. So the crew goes out and catches queens. We catch about, I think it's 128 uh, every four days. And here's, uh, here's Kate and Tucka, and then here's uh, Kirsten and, uh, and our friend from, um, from New, uh, Rhode Island. She's a Chinese national. And so lots of people come to visit us. Kirsten was the editor of American Bee Journal. So people come from all over the place and around the world to, to spend time with us um, as we're catching queens. And so here's, a, here's a, a reasonably good catch for the day. Well, now that we have um, queens available, now we can start setting up our nucleus colonies for overwintering. So this is happening about the 14th or the 15th of June. And now we're into another um, summer honey plant. This is called sumac, staghorn sumac. Wonderful plant. A little bit finicky, but in the right weather, this makes a beautiful vanilla flavored honey. Orange pollen, really a nice plant. 
and our clovers and our vetches, it's another legume, and alfalfa. And so now these are the, the brood factories. You know, even though we're taking brood out of them every once a week, every other week, they get hugely populous. And you have to keep adding combs to them, combs to them, or they're gonna swarm, even though we take brood away. So now we have queens available to catch, queens on my table in the living room, and now we can start making our nucleus colonies. I like to make nucleus colonies on the main honey flow, which starts about middle of June and goes till about middle of July. See, we have one month of, of good honey flow. <clears throat> so I also like to get my nucleus colonies to draw foundation. So if I make these nucleus colonies up on the main honey flow, They'll draw out four or six frames of foundation over the summer, giving me new combs, which is invaluable in my operation. <clears throat> so we're pulling out frames of brood, setting up nucleus colonies. So we'll set up probably 300, 350 nucleus colonies between middle of June and middle of July. Um, we're using about a frame and a half or two, two frames of brood in the early made nucleus colonies. But once we get to the 1st of July, 4th of July, somewhere in there, we start making them a little bit stronger. See, I still want them to draw a foundation. But if we make them up in the early July and let them build up until for a couple of weeks and then try to get them to draw foundation, um, what's happened is that the flow has ended and they can't draw foundation because they just aren't strong enough. So we make them a little stronger than, than two frames. We, we might use three frames of brood after the 1st of July, which, which really builds them into a nice colony, ready to go for the autumn flow. So now we have to do our third round of supering. Well, what does this entail? Supering for calm honey. I want my comb honey, basswood and sweet clover. And the sweet clover basswood flow is about the very end of, of June until the middle of July. So here's the, here's the linden trees, American basswood, Tilia, Amer Tilia americana. You call it lime. These are our lime trees. And so I try to get them, I want this honey in my comb honey. It doesn't crystallize, it's, got, it's like eating candy, it's the most beautiful, flavorful honey for comb honey, white, white cappings. But it takes a real strong colony to make comb honey. This is the kind of, of apiary I use to make my comb honey. The pink boxes are comb honey boxes, okay? So look at, the, look at the bees, look at the surplus bees in these things. This is what it takes to make comb honey. So now we've got, our, we've got our nucleus colonies made. We're done by the middle, by the 10th or the 15th of July. We're still catching queens. We still have queens available. So now we do our midsummer requeening. We identify the colony to be requeened. Now why would that be? Poor brood pattern, a poor honey producer. I've got records over a number of years. We can follow these colonies and see that they're, they're consistently making below the average crop in the apiary. Or chalk brood. Chalk brood is that, bee, that brood disease, that fungal brood disease I showed you. The chalk brood is a very good marker for, for um, hygienicness. And so if a colony that doesn't show chalk brood when others do is an excellent uh, um, candidate for, for breeding hygienic bees. And hygienic bees will, will rid the colony of brood disease before it becomes contagious. So we've identified our, our, um, our colony to be requeened, and now how do we requeen it? We, we uh, there's a number of, right, there's a number of uh, ways direct introduction, well, we can use the mailing cage and pop the cork off the candy end and put them in the, in the, put that queen in the colony after we've de-queened that colony. And 
more often than not, they'll accept that queen. Well, you've, you've removed the first queen, but is there a second queen in that, in that colony that needs to be requeened? How many times does this happen, that you take the queen, but there was a second queen, and, they, and she will kill your introduced queen? Okay, you can also requeen with nukes, nucleus colonies. Very good way to requeen with nucleus colonies. Re Dequeen the colony, give it the nucleus colony with a laying queen, and they accept her very well. What we use mostly are push-in cages, little wire cages that we can locate, that we can isolate the new queen on combs in the colony after the queen, colony has been dequeened and leave her there until she gets accepted and she can start to lay. So here's a frame of brood. We've removed the old queen from the colony. We, we locate a, col a comb that has emerging brood and nectar, brush all the bees off, locate the cage over emerging brood and nectar with no bees, put the queen under the cage and push the cage into the midrib of the comb and put that colony back in the hive. Right back in the colony. Push the combs together, close it up. This, this queen stays there in that cage for four days. Why four days? How long do, when do, when do eggs hatch? They hatch on the third day. So if we leave that cage, queen under that cage for four days, there should be no eggs in the colony, correct? So you, pu you, you, you pull the uh, comb with the cage on it, and you look at the comb outside the cage. Are there any eggs? If there are eggs, guess what? You had a second uh, queen in that colony, and she needs to be removed before you can re redo the cage. This gives you a second chance. So here she is. The queen of the cage has been removed. The push-in cage has been removed. She hasn't been, in, she hasn't been out among the general population for, for more than 30 seconds or a minute. And look at, they're already starting their retinue. They've already ex, uh, accepted her. Why is that? When you requeen with a caged queen, she's not a laying queen. She's a mated queen, yes. Is she a laying queen? No. As soon as I catch these nice fat queens and I put them in a cage on my table overnight, tomorrow morning they're skinny, short little things. They don't smell, they don't act like a laying queen, they don't smell like a laying queen. You put them in a colony, they come out of the cage, they don't act like a laying queen, and sometimes the bees object. But when she's underneath the cage for four days, she starts to lay, she plumps up, they feed her, and then, because now she's a laying queen, she's been brought into lay, now when you remove the cage, she's a laying queen, the bees just accept her and love her right away. Well, sometimes it's not so easy to find the queen. You've been there. I mean, what, what do you do when you can't find the queen? Come back the next day? Well, do you have any better chance of finding her the next day? This is, a, this is a typical thing, they're looking for a queen. Well, I mean, there's four people there looking for a queen in four, in four different spots. I mean, really, where is she? She's in there somewhere. Well, what I do is I made a shaker box. And a shaker box is no more than a, than a serviceable um, brood, brood box with a queen excluder nailed on the bottom. And I can take the colony down, right down to the bottom, take all the combs out, put my shaker box on top of the empty box down below, shake the bees into the shaker box and, and reinsert the, the combs, now beeless combs, underneath the shaker box, and the, the bees will go back down through the queen excluder to get onto the brood, leaving the queen and the drones behind, and there she is. Now we're into harvest, so we've done our requeens. We've done all our, our summer work. We've done all our requeens to try to replace any failing queens, any queens that are questionable. Now we're into honey harvest. Now are we gonna take it all? No, we're not gonna take it all and feed back sugar. We could do that. But you see that 
those dark bands in the top box, that's the bee's protein. That's the bee's protein that they need next spring. And if you take that box away and take their honey and just feed them sugar so they have enough carbohydrates, they don't have any pollen. And how are they gonna raise any brood next spring to replace the bees that are dwindling? You need to leave that box on. So this is harvest. These are the kind of honey crops we get some years. You know, 250 or more pounds of honey. Unfortunately, the deeps always <laughs> seem to be on the top. And so it's a struggle to get them down. But at the same time you're doing harvest, now we have something we have to deal with that I didn't have to deal with when I was early in my career, varroa mites. And so what do we do about this? You can't treat uh, with honey supers on because it would contaminate the honey. So as soon as you get the, the honey off, you need, to, you need to sample to find out what your varroa populations are. And you, and you need to treat with whatever it is you're going to treat with. This is a colony that's uh, crashed from varroa mites. You can see the poor bees died as they tried to come out. They're all full of virus. They don't have any wings. They have a sh short, short, flattened abdomen. The bee in the middle is pretty much what they're supposed to look like when they emerge from their cells. Long wings, plump abdomen. Look at the other two. No wings, fat, uh, flat, stunted abdomen. This is caused by viruses, caused by varroa mites. You need to, do you need to treat your bees for varroa mites or whatever it is you do to, to mitigate that this ex exploding varroa population needs to be done. Now what we do is we sample. We sample about uh, when, we're, when we're doing our requeens. We do our sampling with an alcohol wash. And this uh, little bottle here with the screens, you shake it and we put 300 bees shake it up in alcohol, the mites fall off, <clears throat> there should be on the bottom. This is what we're wanting to see. I'm wanting to see zeros. I don't want to see fives and tens and fifteens and thirties. I want to see zeros. I know that our treatments are working over the year. I know our treatment is working if we find zeros. So then we get into the autumn flow. Loosestrife, purple loosestrife, a European plant, goldenrod, bone set, all kinds of plants that, asters, asters are huge. Goldenrod, wonderful plant. Um, uh, knotweed makes a beautiful dark honey and it's wonderful to winter on. Asters, we have a lot of different asters. This is maybe flat top. Um, New England aster, um, not sure of this kind, but it's a really good late pollen and sometimes nectar flow, which helps with our wintering. So now that's done with, and we have to do our winter preparations. First off, make sure you don't have any disease going into the winter, especially AFB. If you have AFB going into the winter, the colony dies in the winter, and in the spring, your other colonies rob it out, taking the disease home, and now it spreads through your apiary. Never, never take an AFB colony into the winter. We want to check cluster sizes. We need to have big clusters going through our winters because we have such a long cold winter. This is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for bee colonies that are hives that are packed with bees. <clears throat> now we have to make sure they have enough feed. My, my colonies here in, in northern Vermont need 70, 80 pounds of honey. And how would I know that? How would I know there's 70 or 80 pounds of honey? Well, so when do we feed? We feed after the goldenrod flow is finished. So the goldenrod, when they're ripening goldenrod nectar, it has a very, very strong flavor, uh, odor. Some people say that it smells like uh, dirty, dirty gym socks. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't abide by that. I think it smells wonderful. I think it smells ka-ching, ka-ching because this is winter weight for us. This is, what, this is honey that's gonna get our bees through the winter. So how much? Well, I'm uh, feeding it, well, depending on what they need. 
Um, and how will I know that? Because I have a target weight and I weigh every beehive. So achieving the target weight, I use a scale. It fits on my hive stand. I tip the hive sideways, slide the scale underneath it, tip the hive up, and weigh the colony. In my, uh, in my two broods in a, in a super, with the bottom board and the crown board, or the inner cover, if you will, need to weigh 155 or 160 pounds. And for every 10 pounds under that target weight, I give them one gallon of two to one syrup, two sugars and one water, 65% solution. And I feed it all. If, they, if they're 20 pounds light, I give them two gallons. I wanna feed it fast. If you feed them with quart jars over a long period of time, they don't store any of it, they use it to raise brood. But when you feed it to them all at once, it comes in so fast, just like a nectar flow, that they can't use it. And in fact, by feeding the way I do, see, it gets pretty cold. It's been, uh, been pretty frosty lately, and we're feeding bees. But by putting those cans on top of the combs, on top of the frames, the bees go up around the cans and they warm the syrup before they can take it down. So here is we can feed up to five gallons. We can feed up to uh, 50 pounds of syrup at once. And that will be gone in a week, in less than a week, and they just take it down. In fact, they'll cap it. They'll, they'll treat it like, like it was nectar. They'll cap it just like it was honey. You'll find, you'll find uh, wax flakes all over the entrance because the stimulation from the sugar is causing the bee's wax glands to work. And then we get our beautiful colors. This is pretty spectacular. This is my backyard. You know, this is, our area is just noted for for uh, this, the, flaming, the flaming forest of the, of the autumn colors. So now we've got our, our feeding done. We're going to uh, have to wrap the colonies. Now, what do you mean wrap the colonies? Well, we put tar paper around them um, to absorb the heat from the sun because that black wrapper will warm up the inside of the hive enough on a cold, sunny day in the winter that it'll just warm enough so that the bees can break the cluster a little, maybe bring some, uh, bring some honey into the cluster and, and so they don't get isolated and starve, starve uh, on one side of the hive with honey not very far away. And, but this actually might cause moisture problems because we're wrapping the colony up and sealing it all up This is a colony that is wrapped. Okay, the bottom entrance, we put a screen in the bottom entrance for mouse protection, a half inch hardware cloth screen. We have an upper entrance to allow some of the water vapor to vent out of the colony. We have inner cover insulation, crown board insulation to prevent condensation underneath and having it drip on the bees. Remember, we're, we're, we're below zero Fahrenheit. We're 20 below zero Fahrenheit. And they make a lot of, they make a lot of uh, moisture in their, in their uh, you know, from, from eating that honey. They give off a pound of honey, gives off something like, uh, like six tenths of a pound of moisture. And that moisture needs to go someplace. And the black wrapper, as I said, is to, um, uh, for solar gain. So off to the bee yard with uh, what we need to wrap uh, an apiary. You know, the black wrapper, screen, a little duct tape, a little, uh, this is, these are the tools that we use to wrap the colony. Cut the piece of paper that, to fit around the, around the colony, around the hive. So here's the hive we're, gonna, we're going to wrap. And the crown board is just covered with burr comb from the summer, so we have to scrape that off and cover the, uh, the crown board, the inner cover hole, and we put a piece of foam on this. Well, if that hole is open, the bees go up and they chew a hole in the foam. So we cover it with a little duct tape. Now I scraped the, the top, the, the crown board smooth so that the foam will sit on the wood, not up in the air on the, on the burr comb. Then this is our, our 
mouse protection. It's a half inch hardware cloth wedge that, that fills the, the bottom entrance and it's jammed into the, into, the, um, into the entrance, the bottom entrance of the colony. And this allows plenty of ventilation, plenty of air ventilation to remove that excess moisture. Next. And this is what it looks like. Now this is our upper entrance. Now remember how much snow we get here. We can get a foot, two foot, three feet of snow in the winter time. The, the snow will be burying the colonies. The bottom entrances are, are iced over. There's no way that the bees are gonna come out. Well, what happens if we have a nice warm day in the middle of the winter, warm enough for the bees to fly? And, and have a cleansing flight. You know, bees can't defecate till they can fly. They don't do it in the hive. Well, if I didn't have that upper entrance and the bottom entrance was iced over, the bees would never be able to take a cleansing flight until snow melt. So this is what we do. And we put the wrapper on, staple it on with a few staples. This is the upper entrance. You see the bees are all ready already looking out the upper entrance, already saying what's going on. And here's your colony all wrapped up and ready for winter. A Little bit of a forward tilt so it won't, uh, so water won't collect on the bottom board. And here's a nice colony that's all wrapped up, ready to go. Sometimes we, we get an early snowstorm. And we like to try to wrap the bees before, before snow. So we had this one, it was a couple of years ago, we got two October snowstorms of over a foot. So we had to dig out everything, clean everything off, and then wrap. And, you know, they, they, did, they do all right. This, and I just wanted to say, you know, I'm, I'm never too, too worried about my bees in the winter because I have the old man of the mountain watching over them. <laughs> so here we go again, now we're back into winter. Everything is freezing up, here's our first snow of the year, the pond isn't even frozen yet. And the birds, they're just, these are our winter birds, chickadee, little chickadees, like your little tits. And when we really get some snow, to, and then the snow starts to pile up, and now we're working back in the shop again. So the winter time is the time when I get to travel. And so we've, my wife and I have been around the world, UK, Ireland, many times, New Zealand, Canada. Well, this trip I did into Mexico last November was really a highlight. I got a really lovely tour of the, of the, the state uh, of Oaxaca, which is on the Pacific coast in southern Mexico. And one of my main reasons for this trip was um, I was introduced to a school, a technical school, a high school in Oaxaca City. And they teach, one of the things they teach is beekeeping. And the poor kids have, have bee suits that have broken zippers and, and gloves that, 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 that have holes in them and veils that don't work. And so, I started a fund me on Facebook. And I was able to raise almost $7,000 for these kids. And you know, the people at the meeting, we were at a meeting here, at a seminar, and with local folks, local beekeepers. The people knew nothing about what was going on, nothing. The organizers knew, my friend Aurelio, my friend and, and interpreter Aurelio knew, and so, they made, us a, they made us a little a cardboard check, and these two wonderful, wonderful girls came up, and the people just absolutely flipped. They, they really could not believe this, you know? Mexico is, is one of the nicest places I've visited. The people there are so friendly, they're just awesome, and they can't do enough for me. I mean, when I'm done with a, 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 a meeting in a place like this, there are gifts on my, on my table piled up on my table. Honey, avocados. Imagine a loaf of bread. Somebody gave me a loaf of bread. Well, do you know what that means? Do you know what that means to somebody? A loaf of bread? Just, just a wonderful place. 
and I hope to go back there again soon. So anyway, I just want to thank you again for, uh, for inviting me to uh, present to you today. And I just want to say cheers from the crew at French Hill Apiaries. Thank you so much. Okay. So let's have a look, see how many questions we have. Um, let's see, those initial issues around the uh, audio. Uh, okay. Um, the only question I can see, will a recording be available? And the answer is yes. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Out of 220 people, we have no questions. <laughs> well, that's an easy one. <laughs> that's a, that is surprising. We don't normally get, get that. I must have done a good job. Yeah, well, it's pretty thorough. Um, so a question, somebody asked, how many times do you test for Varroa through the season? Oh, uh, well, we first, we started in the spring. So as soon as we can get the colonies open and, uh, and get a reasonable sampling, uh, we start doing some random samples. Um, and if that, everything seems okay, we don't really bother too much until that time when we're requeening. You know, we don't want to, uh, I don't want to be sampling when there's honey supers on. You know, we might have a uh, hundred or 200 pounds of honey on a colony of bees. And you know, to take that honey off to take a sample for Varroa mice and put the honey back on, that's not going to happen. So we get through, uh, we, we usually go through um, when we're requeening since we've got colonies apart and we're looking at brood. Um, and, you know, we're not really looking at the brood in the, in the big honey producers so much. So we're looking at more at the, at the average producers and below average producers and anything we've you know, we've marked as you better look at this one. We're sampling all of those, um, and you know the best laid plans, of course. So this spring we had uh, zero mite counts in all our random sampling. Um, at the end of May, the uh, the seasonal inspector came around and and sampled the the mating nucleus colonies when we're splitting them down into mating nucs, zeros. We're feeling pretty proud of ourselves and think everything is going just hunky dory. And we get to uh, the requeening time, and all those zeros, they became tens and twenties and thirties and fifties and uncountable numbers of Varroa mites, which was a total shock. I mean, it's not like we never sampled it. It's not like we even found ever found one Varroa mite. And so to this day, I just don't understand where those came from how they could have built up that fast from zeros to thirties. Yeah, pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. So we wound up losing 25% of our production hives okay. because of the uh, high mite loads. You know, we were able to uh, recover. Um, and so what went into the winter was looking good. And, uh, and we have uh, probably 300 nucleus colonies that should come out of the winter in good shape. So we're, you know, we're all set. We're going to restock everything. And without those, for, uh, without those nucleus colonies, I'd be lost. Okay. Um, just on the subject of Varroa, what do you use to treat uh, Varroa? What I'm using uh, Amitraz. Amitraz. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, okay. you know, I've tried everything. I Because I've been at this since the, the beginning, uh -huh. since 1989. And I've used everything, starting with Apistan. You know, and um, and check my the horrible stuff that is, and of course, uh, for um, formic acid, different formulations of formic acid, um, oxalic acid vapors, and you know, I just can't get control with no. with the acids. I just it doesn't. It's not good enough. No. So that's the only thing that's working right now is Amitraz. Um. As somebody asked, do you have any trouble with bears? <laughs> you bet. You bet we have trouble. This is a particularly bad year for bears. I have, uh, I've been keeping bees for 40, over 40 years, 40 something years. And on, and on the east side of Lake Champlain, I, I've almost never seen a bear happen. 
I've got a whole series of apiaries. They're like a trap line. They're in, a, in line, so we can do several yards a day. Every one of those this year had to have a, an electric fence put around where, where bears have never, I've never seen bears. The farmers have never seen bears. And now they're just, they're just taking over. It's terrible. But, you know, at least we can build bear fences, electric fences, and it stops them. Uh, you guys are lucky. The worst things you have is badgers. That's true. We also, <laughs> we also have pine martens. <laughs> pine martens and woodpeckers, green pe whatever they are. Yeah, I know. Um, somebody asked, how do you put fondant on the uh, uh, on the top of the frame so that accidentally squishing the the? Well, I move the bees out of the way with my fingers. Yeah. It's usually too cold for a smoker. Yeah. Cold bees. Cold bees don't move with a smoker, but you can kick them out of the way. You know, you just kick them out of the way. And... Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I think probably this is a question of scale, which is a little bit different to yours. And somebody asking, is it possible to have two hives and stay at two, or does two become four, they become six? Uh, it's apparently short in space. There's room for two or three, but not many more. Well, I think that's a good thing that two become three and three become six because your friends are always wanting bees. And then you can give your friends bees and be the most popular uh, person in town or, or you can sell a few colonies off, nucleus colonies off and help pay for your hobby. Yep. Uh, so what breeds of bees do you have and prefer? I prefer carniolan. Um, it's really a, a northern bee. It's better than the Italian bee for us Italian bees. Well, you already know this. Italian bees just make babies. Yeah. And they make babies like they're drunks. And then they starve to death. And that same thing happens here, you know. So, um, you know, I'll, I will say, though, that I, I'm not going to start anything here. But uh, the Buckfast bees really, really saved my apiary back in the 90s when we were being eaten up by Acheron. And, um, and uh, one of the apiaries in, um, in Texas was somehow imported buckfast stock, probably semen, and was raising something, uh, something like a buckfast, but it was resistant to tracheal mites. So as this uh, pandemic was starting out, um, I was able to requeen a large number. Well, the in the springtime, the yellow bees would be dead and the black bees would be alive. So I was able to start over the yellow bee colonies with new stock, with, with buckfast stock, and it really saved my apiary. You know, guys were losing 50%, 80% of their bees, and I was, I was keeping it down below 25% loss. It's interesting because here, most beekeepers have native Irish honeybees, the dark bee, sure. even European bee. Uh, there are a few Buckfast and a few Carniolans, but I, right. many, I, I don't think there are any, I've never heard of Italians here, but I'm sure there are. Right, I'm sure there must be. I mean, th there's nobody importing from, as you said, from Italy before or anything like that? Well, yeah, I'm sure they are, but yeah. you know, I, I, there's, there's a strong move against importation. Oh, well, as there should be, as there should be. Yeah, and there are conservation areas. A lot of counties here are conservation areas for the dark bee, where right. you should have anything other. Than I think that's a great. I think that's a great thing. You know, we don't have that here because we don't have a native bee. Right. Our native bee is the bumblebee. Well, we don't. <laughs> so, so it doesn't really matter, you know. Um, except I'm trying to raise a runner breeding program to improve my sel selection and move, improve my stock. I want dark bees. And, uh, and these, everybody's got to have beehives now. Everybody and their brother wants to have beehives. And where do they get their bees from? Georgia and Florida. And what are they? Italians. So they bring their stock up here and surround me. I just got a government grant for $30,000 to, uh, to try to run a, a bee improvement uh, program with the University of Vermont uh, Bee Lab. And, uh, and I just put out a, a, a plea to the, to the local beekeepers. If you're anywhere within the flight distance of my mating apiary, um, please call me, you know? We have nukes and we have queens available. Yep. So it's an issue, it really is. Okay, the, uh, uh, so this is an interesting question because um, 
um, do you have a constant supply of nectar throughout the season? The issue is that we get short flows and nothing close to what you seem to get. So we have a, the infamous June gap where we get something early in the summer and then later on in the summer. Right. Gap in June. We can. We can have, uh, in a good year, it starts off with uh, the maple nectar that I mentioned saves colonies from starvation. It's not so much that it goes in the supers, but it's happening. And into the uh, dandelion fruit bloom, which can fill supers, and right through the summer flow. And um, after basswood, after lime, that ends about the middle of, uh, or to the third week of July. And then a goldenrod, the fall flow usually starts around August 10th. So yes, we can have a we can have a flow from say the 15th or the 20th of July until the 10th of August when the fall flow starts, but not really a big one. Right. That's just that's okay because that gives us a breather. You know, we like to get the the summer honey off, the light honey off before the goldenrod and the aster and the and the um, uh, knotweed. The knotweed is a buckwheat colored black honey and we don't want that to color our light honey so that gives us a little bit of time to catch up but then of course you get the years when um like this summer we had a drought so as soon as the golden rod, as soon as the dandelion fruit bloom, bloom ended we had a severe drought it was 97 degrees some days where we're trying to make set up cell builders and put queen cells in them and it's so hot you can't breathe and uh, and so that dried everything up because we didn't have any rain. But then as soon as it started to rain again, so by the end of June, we're we're back into honey production. But so we had a month off there, which isn't usual. Um, so do you ever have have you ever had newly mated queens lay drones for a week or so and then start laying workers? Can't say as I have. Um, what was your target weight for winter stores? Uh, um, the, the hive itself with everything, honey and bees and all, needs to be 155 pounds. So that would be the bottom and, and two brews in a super and the crown board. Right. And if it's not 155 or 160 pounds, we feed it until it is. And we, so we give it about uh, one gallon of two to one, uh, two sugar, one water, 65% uh, syrup. Um, per 10 gallon, 10 pounds that the col that the hive is light. So if it's 130 pounds, we give it uh, three gallons. Um, what is your, uh, what are your views in polystyrene versus wooden hives? Um, polystyrenes to me are like keeping your bees in a beer cooler. <laughs> so I don't think we need it here. I, I just, you know, we do very well in the wood hives. I, I know you know, many people in the British Isles like like uh, styrofoam hives, poly hives. I only ever had one. I wanted it at an auction. Uh, and um, and I tried it for three years and it was the only hive in the in the apiary that was soaking wet and dead in the spring. So I gave it away. Okay. Um, so somebody says they have an average five mites a day on one brood box one super, what should they do? How do you remove the super uh, at this time of year? Um, is the super to be harvested, how many harvested from it or is it just for their winter feed? So, I mean, if it's for your winter feed and, and it's gonna be in the part of the brood nest anyway, and you had five mites, I think I might consider treating with something. Yeah, yeah I think probably you know, oxalic acid might be a good thing at that. Moment. Yeah, especially if they're broodless. That would be an excellent time. We, I've tried uh, oxalic vapors. For two years I tried it and I almost lost my apiary. Well, the problem is by the time they're broodless here, it's November and it's, it's cold and the clusters are tight and the vapors don't penetrate the cluster. They just go around the cluster. So it doesn't really, it's not really that effective here. Okay. And I've done the I've done the every five days three times and now the mite counts went from twenty to twenty <laughs> so it didn't do anything. Not much good. No. Uh, so how much honey do you harvest each year? Well, of course it's uh, variable. Um, we're usually producing about thirty ton a year. 
how much well, do you have? Um, because of the drought, it was down to 20 this year. Right. Well, that seems like a lot, but. Yeah. How much do you average per hive? Just curious. Um, I like to make about a hundred pound average. I feel I feel uh, good about a hundred pound average. Okay. But uh, two years ago, we had a very good crop. Overall, the uh, the average was 120. We had we had apiaries that that made 145 per hive. Oh. We, had, we had colonies that made uh, 240 pounds of honey. I mean, there was lots of them that were between 100 and say 180 and 240. A lot of them. Oh. So that's what happens in a year when the flow starts and doesn't stop. Right. Okay. So uh, how often do you harvest the honey? Just at the end or do you just, just that one? Just once. Yes. Mm -hmm. In August, there's too much to do during the season. So we can't stop to harvest honey and extract and then put supers back on. So we just pile them up and pile them up. So some years they're over your head. <laughs> um, so Let's see what's the next one. Um, maximizing the bee population, like in your photos, while preventing swarming is like walking on a tightrope. How do you do it successfully? Um, well, there's a number of re ways. Uh, mechanically, <clears throat> early supering and reversing of the brood chambers to, to keep the upward movement all the time of the queen and overhead storage of nectar. <clears throat> but also, I don't uh, use. Um, splitting or artificial swarming as my primary um, swarm control method. And so I'm actually searching for bees that have a lower propensity to swarm. And I can select from those colonies that just don't start queen cells um, like, the, like the high propensity colonies do. And, but I would never know that if I, if, if splitting a colony was my default method of swarm control. So do we ever lose any? Of course, but splitting is the final solution, not the first solution. And so we can find giant colonies that, that I, like I say, will make 240 pounds or 180 pounds of honey and not swarm. Right. Um, let's see, what's your opinion on leaving a super of honey uh, per colony over the winter? Um, well, of course, you know, I have two, two broods and a super. So obviously I'm leaving a super of honey on over the winter. Um, I was at a, a dinner in, my goodness, uh, Bucks. I think it was in Buck, Buckinghamshire. And, and we had two dinner parties there. And, and, and one night an older gentleman, I don't remember people's names, I wish I did. But he asked me a question. Um, what do you do about isolation starvation? I think isolation starvation is in part uh, uh, set up by having a single brood. Mm -hmm. And so all, the, all the, the bees have to work horizontally. But with a honey super on top of a single brood, now the bees can work vertically, which is their natural, their natural motion is to move up, move up onto honey. And so the bees get stuck over on one side of the hive. Well. Now there's also another thing I think that when you put the bees to bed in the fall, in the autumn, there was a nice big cluster and the bees were in contact with all that honey. And then when you look at them in the spring or when they've starved to death because of isolation, starvation, they have a much smaller cluster and they're no longer in contact with the honey that, that was in the hive. Why is that? Why did they lose that part of that, enough of that cluster so they're no longer in contact? Well, if you would have had, um, overhead super of honey, they could have moved up onto it much more easily than horizontally. Yeah. So how often do you check for queen cells? I suppose probably this really is how often do you do an inspection of each hive? Yeah, we don't really check for uh, swarm cells too often. We check um, when we're reversing and um, that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. um, right. We don't have, there's just too many bees and too much work to do to, uh, to be checking constantly. But, you know, if we do check, all we're doing is uh, tipping up the top brood box and check and looking to see if there's any cells started on the bottom boards, bottom bars. Okay. So it's actually a pretty, pretty easy, it's a quick check. We're not pulling frames. All right. Um, how did you choose such a rich site? Such a what? Rich site, I think. Really, were you just did you just look out and having 
so much forage around around your acres. I think so. Yes, I moved to the uh, to the Champlain Valley when I went to the university in uh, 1967, and I, you know, I wanted to get to get back into agriculture or something, and so I started out making maple syrup, and so gathering maple, maple sap and boiling it all night, and you breathe the, the fumes of the syrup, and it gets the blood, the sugar gets in your blood, and your you can't close your eyes and you can't sleep. You go till three o'clock in the morning watching these foolish little bubbles and it starts to make you think, you know, at the time I had a few beehives and I said, wow, you know, the bees gather it, the bees boil it, the bees package it. What in the heck am I doing here at three o'clock in the morning boiling sap? And so I gave that up pretty quickly and got into bees. Okay. But it was just, it's a notorious area. It's, a, it's an original land of milk and honey, you know. Champlain Valley was the uh, was the bread basket of the colonies. This is where the colonies grew their food. Okay, we're pretty fortunate here. Um, is there a maximum number of hives you keep in one area? We try to keep around twenty four in a and and have them two miles apart. Okay. Uh, my cell bill is, and of course, it depends on the forage. So my cell building yard apiary has thirty strong colonies. For, for raising queen cells, probably uh, six or eight breeder colonies and nearly 70 brood factories. And they still, they still do very well. They build up well, they make, they make over a hundred pound average almost every year. Well, that's pretty good. That, that's an exceptional apiary. Yeah. Um, let's see. <clears throat> How do you get rid of your honey supply? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you. With all the garbage that's coming in from from around the world, it's gotten really difficult. I've had, I've got honey on hand now that is from 2016, 17, 18, 19, and 20. I started December with about oh my gosh, it must have been 80,000 pounds of honey in the in the shed. You know, it's getting a little better now. Um, people are finally starting to realize that what's coming in from overseas is mostly rubbish. Um, but it's really difficult to uh, to sell honey now with, you know, you can buy all the honey you want, truck loads, trailer loads, boat loads at the port of entry in the U.S. for 50 cents a pound. You know, it's coming from Vietnam and Ukraine and India and I mean for 50 cents a pound I, I find it really hard to believe that it's honey. Yeah. I mean yet to try to get our government to help us out and actually go out and test and you know a real test. I don't know. It's difficult. That's you know, thank God I have queens and nukes to sell too. Yeah. yeah. So yeah I think it's a general problem. I think it's around the world. In Mexico it's the same. Where you are it's the same. I I, I read the uh What's the name of the grocery store that's uh, that's put out all this uh, rubbish, honey? It's a main, major grocery chain in your in your country. I can't remember the name of it, or maybe it's over in the UK. I don't know, but it's you know, it's the same thing. Yeah. And they have and they have all these certifications on the label saying that it's pure and natural, and it's bogus. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Difficult. Okay, uh, I'm a new beekeeper going to my first full year. All these, there you go, all these, right? There's oh, nothing. Honey, Actually, no, they, their honey has been tested by our okay. department, yeah. our, the Food Standards Authority, and it yeah. was it was genuine. Oh, yeah, good. So, you know, but it is cheap. Yeah. yeah. So this next question is, I am a new beekeeper going into my first full year with two hives. When do you think your first... Your, your first check in the year, let's see. Oh, when do you do your first check in the year? Is there an issue with over or under checking hives? Well, certainly there's a, a issue with over checking a hive. Um, under checking, yeah, of course, if they swarmed or they starved or anything like that, of course there's, uh, so there's issues with both. Um, you're, you're gonna have to uh, um, fine tune your, um, your management over the years, but my first inspection, you no, know, you're almost in spring already. You know, we've got two feet of snow on the ground and it's gonna be below zero Fahrenheit tonight. So 
our first, as soon as we can get out in the spring, uh, in March, we'll start popping uh, crown boards just to see if they have uh, honey left over. But we really can't do any inspections until later in April when we can actually pull, pull frames and check for queen, queen rightness and whatever. But. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, have you had any problems with resistance or a uh, resistance development using amateurs? Uh, not yet to amateurs, but everything else we've ever used, of course. Yeah. No, we used uh, Apistan. That's the only thing they gave us for 10 years. That didn't work. We used um, Check My for a year, but quit immediately. That's the reports came out what, how horrible that was. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen any uh, resistance to Amitraz, although the reports are starting to come out that I've even heard um, a friend of mine in the UK is thinking that it's that his bees are now, mice are now resistant to Amitraz. So I don't know. I, it's scary. Yeah. Um, if a hive isn't treated for Varroa, can it build up a resistance over time? To Varroa? Yeah, I think. Um, I guess in maybe uh, in a few eons of time, it probably will. Problem is they're, they're usually dead. So yep. they're not building up any resistance. You know? Um, you know, we've been doing this for 30 years and trying everything from breeding and selecting from strong stock in the spring and doing mite counts and and you know you think you've got something going and and then the next year they're they're they've got a huge population again they've gone on for a couple of few years and or you breed from something that has a low mite count and it keeps the low mite count and you breed daughters from that and you and you sample them and they got high mite counts it's just it's not following through there's something other than breeding going on and we don't know what what the uh, the mode of uh, of resistance is? Is it mechanical? Did they swarm? Did, is it what is it? What's going on? So I don't know. I hope we figure it out sometime. I hope before I'm uh, I'm done. I'm I'm 72 on Sunday, so I ain't got much time left. <laughs> I don't know. My parents are in their 90s, so you got another 20 years anyway. <laughs> of course, of course. Well, I got so much pee venom in me. My friends say I'm never gonna die, but whatever. Yeah, um, they, don't want me. they don't want me. I'm venomous. Uh, what do you think about queen excluders? Um, thank you all, uh, Amor. But um, and, uh, be, honey, uh, be ex, uh, queen excluders have their have their purpose. Um, I don't use them on production hives. That's another another reason why I think I can uh, grow such big colonies and not have them swarm. So I have an unlimited brood nest. If that queen wants to go up into the bottom super and, and lay there and that makes her comfortable, okay, fine. I can deal with that. I can't deal with my bees hanging in the trees. Um, but I do use queen excluders in my queen rearing process. I have to, but, uh, but not in production hives. Okay. Um, let's I'm trying to find, find where I was. I, um, I'm conscious of the time. I don't want to keep you going too long. Uh, it's, it's repeated a lot of questions. Hey, I got a day off here. I'm not. I'm not worried. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if colonies are low in pollen coming out of winter, is it ever too early to give pollen sub or supplement? Uh, no, I think you can put a uh, a pollen substitute on the as a patty on the top bars on top of the cluster right on the cluster or move them out of the way, but right there so they're in contact with it. You can start that very early. I can start that with, with snow on the ground. And if it's, as soon as I can open up the crown boards, uh, I, I'm, putting, uh, I'm putting pollen sub. Okay. Um, so somebody asked, uh, I'm going to graft this year for the first time. When cells are introduced to a queen right cell finisher, why does the existing queen not swarm? Well, I guess sometimes they probably do. I, I guess it's, uh, see, I don't really use a, uh, I don't use a swarm box starter queen right finisher the way that in that, that method, I use, um, I use brother Adam's method of stocking a strong colony with excess frames of brood above a queen excluder. 
And, um, and then 10 days later, when all the, the brood is emerging, but no larvae, I, I separate the colony. Um, the queen right section goes on the ground behind the stand facing backwards. And I set up the, uh, the cell building uh, box on the stand on a new bottom. And, um, and so on, on grafting day, on setup day, 10 days before a graft, I check it for queen cells. So there are no queen cells. And then on grafting day, 10 days later, um, I'm taking the colony apart. I'm, I'm removing the nurse bees from the queen right and putting them in the queenless cell builder. I'm checking for queen cells. Um, and 10 days later, I'm harvesting. I, five days later, I reunite the unit with the cells above an excluder. Five days later, which is 10 days after graft, I, re I, I harvest the cells, place the cells, come back and reestablish the colony as a cell builder again. So I'm looking at every 10 days, I'm inspecting those cell builders for queen cells. Do any of them start? Of course, because I'm making huge colonies and we're on a flow, of course they do. But if you're checking every 10 days, it's not likely that they're gonna swarm before, you know, longer than 10 days. So I don't really have too much, uh, too much issue with uh, swarming in my uh, cell builders. Um, what do you use in your smoker? Uh, you must go through a very large amount. I do. Um, I really like second cut hay. So I use bales and bales of it. We probably used at least 10 bales a year for a second cut hay. It's nice, cool smoke, and it's usually pretty cheap. Um, what do you think of genter kits, you know, these cup kits? Um, I like to graft. Um, you know, I, I tried the Gentner before, I never the Nyko Nico or whatever it is. Um, and you know, you get the, you get the cell builder set up, all the work has been done. Now you need to do your graft or you need to do, to harvest your, uh, 12 hour old larvae and you go to the Gentner and there's nothing there but eggs or there's nothing there cause the, they ate the eggs yeah. or, or just, and you've done all the work and now what do you got to do? So, I mean, grafting, if your eyes are good and your hands aren't too shaky, you can get jeweler's loops and a, and a headlamp and, uh, and practice, and practice uh, grafting. You know, you can you graft and, and with, with a Chinese grafting tool, it picks up the puddle of gel. You don't even touch the larva. And you can practice grafting and, and placing the larva with the little puddle of jelly right on your thumbnail. When you get good on the thumbnail, then you can start putting them in the cups. And then you can go younger and younger and younger until you can get a, a larva that you can almost can't see. As soon as it's floating on jelly, you can you can graft it. So, you know, personally, I don't like contraptions. But, you know, but I'm not saying because some people need that. They their hands shake or they can't see well. So if that's what you need, then you do it. Yep. Um, what do you think causes hive collapse? You mean colony collapse disorder? Probably varroa mites. Almost surely it's varroa mites. Um, and here's an odd one. I don't know. Have you ever heard of Ken and Dan Basterfield? They use double brood boxes with no queen excluders on their production colonies. This is statement. It's not a, not a question. Who did um, I hear of whom? Pardon? Who did, did I hear of whom? I, did you hear what? What did the, what was that question? Oh, sorry. It was uh, it was just a statement. It wasn't. Oh, oh okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you handle a, a hive that hasn't swarmed yet but is loaded with capped queen cells? Um, first off, I determine if the colony swarmed or not. Um, if they swarmed already, I put the hive back together again and be done with it. Um, you could at that point, uh, if they've swarmed. Um, and the cells haven't emerged yet. Uh, I suppose you could sacrifice the colony, break it up into nucleus colonies, and and make several nucleus colonies. You could do that also. Um, if I don't think the colony is has swarmed yet, you know, one of the ways is you the queen likes to lay in cells that have recently emerged brood. They clean the bees clean it up, and she loves that place to lay. So if you find a 
frame of emerging brood um, and you look for eggs in that recently emerged brood. And if there's eggs, it's pretty likely that nothing's, that they haven't swarmed yet. If the population is still high, no cells have hatched, um, they probably have not swarmed yet. If, if in fact, though, they are backfilling, <clears throat> backfilling the combs of emerging brood. So when the brood emerges, they fill it with nectar, colony is swarmed. Okay. Um, uh, let's see, uh, is there any heather in your area? I suppose it's just another crop to ask you about. No, just in people's flower gardens. No, I wish we did. I love I love heather honey, but no, we don't have that here. Um, have you ever tried thermal treatments? I have not. I've heard of it, but I have not. Yeah. Um, if Conley, oh, sorry, no, that was that. Uh, I think. Oh, hang on a second. You can lay on the the. Like, let's see. What are your average losses in winter time? No, oh, somewhere ten percent, fifteen percent. Yeah, it's about about the same everywhere, really. Yeah, I think. Um, you keep your varroa mites under control. That should be about right. Somebody says, in my limited experience of high splits, I found the bees to be incredibly angry when queenless. Have you ever experienced this? Absolutely. And so it's a, almost, um, when you get one that's not normally like that, you, that's the first thing you ask is, uh, do they have a queen? Um, so I, I can we just, okay. How about wooden frames versus plastic frames? Presumably that's also applies to the, to the foundation, plastic foundation. Right. Wax. I was always, uh, wooden frames and wired wax foundation. And, um, and, and over the years, uh, recently, especially with the issues with our flows, with all the maize they plant, reducing our, some of our, our flows, when you use wired wax, they chew the wax off the wires and ruin the foundation. Um, and it's also very time consuming to wire frames and embed, embed wires and so just uh, three years ago, I moved to um, wax, uh, plastic, waxed plastic, but I dip the plastic uh, foundation in hot wax. So we get quite a lot of wax on the foundation. And I think they love it. And you know, if, if something's wrong with it, you scrape the, the comb off and, and they rebuild it. So, you know, economically it's, it's, a, it's a wonder. Um, I prefer not to have plastic in my house, but it's just got to the point where uh, there was really no other, uh, no other path. Yep. And so that brings us to the question of well, how frequently do you replace the wax in your brood frames? Um, it's an ongoing process. You know, we started this quite a number of years ago. I'm still finding combs that must be 50 years old. I bought a lot of uh, a lot of uh, beehives from, from retired and dead people. And, um, and they've been, these colonies, they just go on and on and on. Well, it's time. So when a colony dies, we get rid of all the old stuff and, and reestablish uh, um, new colonies on new combs. And so we're almost there. We're, we're well underway. I'd say another year or two, we've got it done. Um, let's see. What do you use for pollen substitute? I use something called Ultra Bee from Man Lake. Yeah, I like that product. It's uh, the bees really like it. I, I mix it with sugar syrup and uh, with sugar and water and a little bit of vegetable oil, right. just to keep it from drying out too fast. Mm -hmm. I use uh, let's see. So it's uh, let's see. It's uh, seventeen pounds of hot water and. Uh, and 42 pounds of sugar. I put, I use a, a, a cement mixer for this. <laughs> or, yeah, right. And 42 pounds of sugar and get that going and get that turning well. And then six cups of vegetable oil and get that turning really well. And then 25 pounds of Ultra B. And it makes a great soft uh, patty that 
just thick enough so it won't run down between the frames. Um, do you render down old comb to save the wax and do you make it? No, we have some wonderful bonfires. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've tried this before, you know, rendering old combs. I don't have a steam chest. And so you just wind up with a big mess and most of the wax stays in the mess and the cocoons and everything. It's just, you, I just can't get enough wax out to make it worth it. Yeah. Um, how often do you rotate the brood boxes? Um, once a year okay. in the uh, in the spring when at the beginning of the dandelion bloom. So they have empty comb to move up on. And I know some people, Gosh, I've heard of some people rotating, uh, reversing the boxes uh, every 10 days to two weeks. My God, you know, what a job. It's, it's, it's the hardest job we do is reversing the brood chambers on, on six or 700 colonies of bees, you know, in two weeks in May, you know, going like crazy, like banshees, trying to get it done before, you know, before uh, everything hits the fan. And it's just, it's a heck of a job. And you yeah. know, once is enough. Um, do you ever use quilt boxes or do you have too many hives for it to be effective in your winter? Yeah, I, I do not use quilt boxes. I do use uh, crown board insulation, either um, either some kind of rigid foam or uh, an empty super with shavings or dry leaves or dry hay. Um, quilt boxes, you know, quilt boxes are there to absorb the moisture. And, um, and what happens how much insulation value do you have in wet insulation? I would say not a heck of a lot. So I prefer to let the excess moisture vents out of the hive through that upper entrance rather than gets absorbed by the quilt box uh, shavings or whatever. And besides, you know, the a, a piece of rigid foam costs how much, you know, I don't know a few dollars, not very much. And, and the quilt box costs how much? And you have to replace the shavings every year? Well, I'll bet it costs $25 over here for a quilt box. So with, with 600 highs times $25, I think not. Um, and also, what do they have? Bee cozies, right? They get that, that black plastic with insulation on the inside. Yeah. Well, you don't need insulation all being, all the insulation does is prevent the hive from warming up on a warm day because it works both ways. Right. So just a wrapper of black black paper is is quite enough. Um, how, how many people in your operation uh, at maximum? Um, this summer I had three employees, uh, five on, on Queen Catch Day. Because um, we need some extra help those days, and there's there's a couple of people that only come on Queen Catch Day, but but my full time employees are um, there's three of us. Okay. Oh, no, there's four of us. I have three employees. Yeah. Um, do you use open mesh floors or solid floors? Solid, solid, solid floors. Okay. Uh, when you reverse the the brood and supers, what what do you use as a floor? I'm not sure what that means. Um, well, we tip the hive onto the backwards off the hive stand and lay it on the ground and remove the bottom, the floor, and put it back on the hive stand and then put the bo top box on there and then the middle box and then the bottom goes on top, the right. bottom box. So it's the same thing. We don't, we don't use anything different. Yeah. Um, I'm just down here and just seeing on the, on the chest to see if there are anything. Um, it's a it's just a mix of all sorts of stuff okay so i think we've covered most of the questions some of them are very difficult to find they're in the chat so right uh so somebody suggested that i should sing happy birthday <laughs> <laughs> well happy birthday to you too <laughs> Thank you, anyway. Okay. So anyway, so I have to say thank you very much for your time. Yeah. And uh, you know, we, can, um, we can celebrate uh, the next time um, I get invited over to, uh, to Ireland and um, 
and uh, when we can have a couple of pints of Guinness or something. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I look forward to it. Keep it, keep it in mind for when this darn pandemic is finished. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and hopefully you'll make it over for for Gormanston one year. I really, you know, it's. I wish it wasn't in July. Yeah. You know, it's always right in the right in the middle of our queen rearing. You know, but um, you know, the last time we were over was I don't know a couple of years ago, and it was what a nice trip. You know, we started in Cork. And then we spent several days there. It was just, we saw wonderful places. John took us all over the, oh my gosh, he's, he took us to some great places. Then we went to County Clare and we found my, my wife's ancestors, which, which she was over the clouds, I'll tell you. We found the, set, the graveyard, we found the old farmstead, we found, we found, we found her relatives. <laughs> we, found, we found people that knew where her grandfather's grave was in, in Montpelier, Vermont, her great great grandfather, I mean, that went out of Ireland in 1845. <laughs> it was awesome. It was just really nice. And we wound up in Donegal eventually, but what a great trip that was. Sounds really good. Anyway, thank you very much again. Yes. And uh, thank you everybody for attending and for your yep. patience with the initial sort of poor quality sound. But we got there in the end. So, yep. so take thank care, you. everyone. And Good night, everyone. Good night.